Welcome back. This week will be, or sorry, not this week, this lesson will be looking at uh, what happens after Mexico gets independence, focusing on the Southwest, not so much in, in Mexico. Uh, this one should be fairly brief because um, I don't have too much to, to address here. Um, but it is a very important one because this is where we see the conflict between the United States and Mexico. Uh, here's a picture of Los Angeles. So those of you that grew up in LA, this is um, downtown LA back back in the day, right? Probably the eighteen you know, late eighteen hundreds uh, before it before it got crowded. So we're going to start by looking at um, before this conflict with the United States. So. Uh, Mexico goes goes through in its independence uh, from Spain uh, about 1810 with it. You prob probably already know this, right? Grito de, Dol de Dolores kind of starts everything off. And that kind of continues up to about 1821. Well, um, you know, there's this war happening um, in central Mexico with a kind of bourgeois class and, you know, those castizos and, and, uh, and Spain over, you know, down south. But... Over here in this kind of frontier land, they're not, um, you know, they're not too aware, or, you know, just because of distance, maybe they just don't care. It's not, it's not as big of a issue up here as it was down central Mexico. It's almost like they're just waiting to find out what happens in the end. But um, once Mexico gets independence, it, it does impact um, different parts of, uh, particularly this frontier region. So. You have this kind of, um, we, we already kind of talked about it, right? This kind of frontier land. Um, these people were known as fronterizos, the people who were inhabiting you know, New Mexico, Texas, and, and um, California, and so on. <clears throat> and we begin to see how American encroachment begins to have that influence. Earlier I mentioned, right, it was the Russians, it was the British, it was the French, right? All these different groups trying to take Mexico's or New Spain's land, um, by the 1800s, it's the Americans who begin to come over in small numbers, create economic relationships with Native American groups that are in these places. And this gives some of these groups certain resources that they didn't have before, such as guns and horses and things like that. In Arizona, I mean, Arizona is kind of like a good example because what happens during this period is that basically Arizona somewhat disappears during this period. Um, we find that Native uh, American populations begin to attack, you know, the settlements um, in in this region. And um, really, again, it's it's where the mission's located. Uh, the Apache Apache uh, Native American community basically drove out um, any of the population that was located in, in these places. So um, the mission system had a had to close. They they just had to leave because of what happened. They actually reopened, but the the presidio, the the military, um, I guess barracks, the, those actually completely closed uh, by eighteen forty eight. So, um, sorry, um, uh, yeah, it was in 1848. Uh, so between this kind of like 1821 to 1848 period, um, we see these, these conflicts happening and you know, Arizona gets depopulated. California is a different story. We find that, at least when it comes to settlement, the population was about 3,000 in 1821, which is quite small, correct? Uh, there's a lot of Native American people still around, probably in the tens of thousands in California. But when we're talking about communities, um, the, the settlements are fairly small. So all over California, uh, it's about 3,200, which is almost nothing. And we find that, um, I mentioned last time that um, the church controlled a lot of territory in these places, but by the... Um, by the um, 1830s, we begin to see uh, the state uh, kind of take away some of that territory that they had. And they begin to open it up to different populations, particularly people who are, they want to, to move up north and settle you know, some of this land. 
And like I said earlier, some of this land is, is some of the prime t um, property where you can grow a lot of goods. So because of this kind of secularization of church land, that's what that sentence basically means, um, it's about 14 million acres in, just in Southern California that are kind of open to people to, to migrate north. You have this kind of rise of a new group, um, kind of like this, this new class of people, and those are called the, the Dons, right? And, and you know the word because it's part of our culture, right? When we call people Don Jose, Don, Don Pablo, right? Um, it's these kind of words of respect, but it's also tied to economic status that these people are significant in the community, but also have some kind of means. So you have this kind of growing population of what is essentially like a ranch aristocracy um, between this period of 1821 to 48. And here you see some of the pictures. Uh, these are the daughters of, of, of um, a family in, in um, San Diego. And then this is uh, Pio Pico. I'm not sure if you've ever been to Pico Rivera in California. Um, <clears throat> you can kind of see the racial makeup, right? Whereas in places like um, places like um, our, um, Central Mexico, he probably would have been fairly poor. In places like California, he becomes a very important person. I think he's governor of California before, before um, he would become part of the United States. Uh, so you see this kind of mobility of different groups of, of people when it comes to you know, different ethnicities. And, and the Dons control a large portion of this territory. Um, they own hundreds of acres, um, if not thousands of acres. And if not that any of us have owned that much, but imagine owning that much and trying to determine territory, right? <laughs> territory boundaries in particular. I mean, God knows where they begin and God knows where they end. So they have a general idea of where these territories are, are located and you know where, 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 what are the boundaries, but they're never very specific. And this will be important as we move forward once the Americans come over. Okay, so keep a note of that. Um, during this period, we find that um, women are actually given land too. We find that 13% of land grants were actually given to women during this period. And we find certain women that, you know, own thousands of acres. So Doña Juana Pacheco, who was a widow, um, she was able to own her land. And this is something that I addressed earlier, right? But she was able to own 17,000 acres. That's, that's a lot of land, right? Um, and again, trying to just imagine that amount of land. And, and how do you account for that? Um, will become very important as we move forward. Um, during this period, you see that a lot of times boundaries are determined by geographical areas. Um, so a lot of times they say, well, you know, the mountains, that's where my, my land ends and rivers and, and things like that, right? Uh, and, and that becomes very problematic as, as we move forward. <clears throat> All right, so there you have the rise of a new group of people. And again, we'll talk about the Dons um, after 1848 too, so keep them in mind, don't forget them. <clears throat> now, after Mexico gets independence, we actually um, develop a border between these two countries, between the United States and Mexico. And up here you see that map, right? Where they there's a treaty established showing a border between US and Mexico, right? I'm sure Mexico would have thought, oh man, we should build a wall, <laughs> right? Because <laughs> all hell breaks loose after this. So in 1819, define borders, right? And this is the, the funny thing about um, about history and you know Americans kind of complain about open borders and things like that it's like hey, hey look what happened back here <laughs> right should should have closed that one down um, but um, a lot of people decide not to move to places like Texas from Mexico uh, Mexico had just come out of the you know it's it's independence it, it's struggling financially um, there's really no economic commerce happening up in you know these northern regions. It's just kind of open territory to some extent, right? I mean, there's people there, uh, there's Native Americans and so forth, but there's you know you need business in order to sustain and survive, right? You need infrastructure, you need those type of things. So nobody really wants to move up there. So what the Mexican government does is that it opens up the, this territory to Americans. And if you know the proximity of Texas to the American South, 
that's going to be very problematic, right? <clears throat> so uh, some of the early people that come over are people like Stephen Austin. You probably have heard the name because he's um, there's a city named after him, probably the most I think, liberal city in Texas, which I'm not sure what that means. But, you know, they're, they're, uh, he comes over and he kind of, he's from the South, and they bring over like about 300 families. They're each given about 5,000 acres. And there are certain conditions in order for them to take some of this land. So when they come over, Mexico basically tells them, look, you can have this land, but you have to follow, follow the law. Which again, this is something... The irony is just hilarious sometimes, right? Because <laughs> this is something Americans complain. Mexicans don't, or immigrants don't follow the law. Well, well guess what? Neither did your ancestors. So number one, uh, the Mexican government uh, implemented these rules saying, look, you can take this land, but you have to obey Mexican laws. And one of them was that um, Mexico had outlawed slavery um, once it got independence. So you could not bring people over as property so this is a this is a condition that was put upon them number two two they had to learn spanish this was mexico you're in a new country you got to learn that language right again uh the irony right where um anti-immigrant people say oh these people don't want to learn english well you know americans didn't want to learn spanish <laughs> back in the uh, 1800s when they were given this territory and number three, they had to renounce um, their faith, their Protestantism, and convert to Catholicism because Mexico is a very Catholic country. Um, and, and, you know, they're pretty much, you know, one state, one religion type of mentality. So you have a um, these rules set up that um, the... Americans completely ignored. I mean, they, they came over. Um, they're not going to let go of their property, right? If they own slaves. That's something that they feel they, they own. It's, it's their right to, to keep. Um, they've always spoke English, so they're not going to give up their language and learn this new language. Uh, and their faith, they see that as, as part of you know, who they are. So again, they're not, they don't convert to Catholicism. So this kind of opens the window to a lot of problems. Um, Quite quickly, the American, um, it's kind of like this American migration into Texas grew fairly fast. And what um, Mexico tries to do is it, it tries to close its border. We find that within a few years, um, I mean, if you look, at, this is like in the 19, or 1820s, by the 1830s, and, uh, Anglo-Americans begin to dominate in regards to numbers down in texas about twenty five thousand are uh of the population are anglo-american remember earlier i mentioned that for the mexican or for during new spain populations ranged in, in the thousands and a few right two hundred two thousand one thousand quite quickly americans you know overrun them and and they come over partly because you know this is fertile ground they they able they're able to grow cotton and uh, there's a need for labor so they, they quickly outnumber the, the Mexican population in Texas. You know, Mexicans only represent about 4,000 people. So it's not, it's not too, many, too many people. So in, by 1832, Mexico outlaws um, basically what becomes illegal immigration into Mexico. And um, unfortunately, again, there's no border patrol. There's nothing there. It's just tells them not to come to Mexico and obviously they don't listen and um, it, it creates this kind of friction and uh, between the country itself Mexico and these migrants um, as you can kind of see as Americans begin to dominate uh, the Mexican population becomes dependent on them so when when you have this push towards independence and I'm going to show you a video about this um, the, the Mexican people in Mexico tend to side with the people from Texas, um, the Anglo-Americans from Texas, because they're interconnected in, in, in many different ways. Economically, it's one of them, right? So um, Mexico kind of loses control of this Pandora's box that they opened at this time. All right.
So what did we learn? Number one, we, we kind of see the birth of a new group of people um, right, right after Mexico's independence. We, we see this, the rise of the Dons, of the, that kind of ranch aristocracy. And, um, and it's important to know that they're very mixed because that changes. It doesn't change. It, it, it's the way that it's perceived later in history completely changes. So again, we see Pio Pico as very racially mixed. Um, but um, by the time the Americans take over California, you'll read about this, they begin to present these old Spanish days as being very white. Uh, we talked about, again, this is still very frontier um, society, frontier culture with the Dons. Uh, and then the last point that we see is how Americans begin to encroach into Mexican territory. And this really kind of leads up to the conflicts that we have between these two major nations. And it begins to shape the relationship between those people that settled um, in, in some of this territory. Uh, again, in, you know, the, the Mexican people in particular um, and conflicts that become very racialized. All right, so I think we'll stop it there. And we'll continue the next lesson.